Professor Joseph Parker that is going to be joining us by Zoom. By Zoom, sorry. Uh, so please welcome him, and let's hope we're going to have a lively and fascinating discussion. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Awesome. All right. You. I can see like a few pixels moving around, so I assume. It was a people, so thank you for coming. Um, it's a huge privilege to be invited. I'm really um, disappointed I couldn't make it, but um, I made sure I woke up at 3.30 in the morning so I could um, at least give my talk by Zoom. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is, um, I guess, one of the sort of major unknowns in evolution at all levels of complexity, which is how entities evolve to cooperate with each other. Um, in this instance, how cell types within organs evolve to um, codepend to generate emergent organ functions. And I want to give you a bit of background about how uh, I and my lab um, entered into this problem um, through our studies on interactions between species. Now, I would say that um, ever since Darwin, biologists have got a relatively coherent, if not complete, understanding about how evolution proceeds from the level of molecules to populations, um, and also from the perspective of mechanisms and also the ultimate population genetic forces that drive evolutionary change. But species are really nothing without the interactions they forge within their ecological communities. And we have a very superficial understanding of how interactions and ecological relationships emerge during evolution. We don't really know why species fall into nascent relationships with each other. And we really have no idea how organisms specialize as they undergo this transition to more complex, often symbiotic or specialized relationships. What are the kind of ancestral contingencies that shape the subsequent part of evolution? And so the work in my lab is focus really on understanding the evolution of relationships between species. Um, and this is not something we can typically study in standard model organisms like fruit flies or mice, which show very limited interactions with other species. And we don't really know enough about their natural ecology to be able to understand how their phenotypes have been shaped by interactions within ecological communities. And of course, something like you know, a whale shark and a remora, that's a very different, difficult model system to reconstitute in the lab. Um, and so there's this kind of black box regarding the emergence and fate of ecological relationships between species at a mechanistic level. And so the group of organisms that we study in my lab are the beetles, the coleoptera. There's about 400,000 described species of beetles. That means one in every four living things that we've given a name to is a species of beetle. And the reason there's probably so many beetles, as opposed to other groups of animals in particular, is because of their special morphology. So beetles, unlike most other insects, have these structures here, which are the elytra, these hardened forewings, which cover the delicate fly wings. Um, and it's a, a physical strengthening of the morphology of these insects, which has enabled them to infiltrate many different parts of terrestrial ecosystems, which are shut off to insects that have delicate, membranous wings. Okay, so insects can live a subterranean lifestyle, they can get under bark, they can invade many different parts of plants, which other insects can't. And so insects are diversified in a huge number of uh, niches that other insects can't get into, but they can still retain the ability to fly and disperse and speciate. And that's probably why there's so many species of beetle. But within the coleoptera, one thing that most biologists, I would say, don't, um, aren't aware of, is that the largest family of beetles, and in fact the largest family in the entire animal kingdom, are a group of beetles that don't look like your typical beetles. And these are the rove beetles, the family Staphylinidae. The 64,000 species of rove beetles, that's about the same size as all of the vertebrate subphylum put together. Um, and this is a small fraction of the true number out there. Um, and rove beetles differ to most other beetles because they're elytra, the wing cases are very short. Okay, you can see these structures here. The beetles can still fly, 
Okay, the five wings are packed under here and with this kind of orange army like pattern of folds. But you can see the abdomen, right? These segments here, the abdomen's kind of elongate and the segments are flexible and telescoping. And this enables rogue beetles to move rapidly through substrates, feeding on other uh, invertebrates. And so within the Coleoptera, there's been a secondary modification of the body plan and this huge global radiation of this large predatory clade. And this is a really gaudy example of a rogue beetle. Most of them do not look like this. Most of them look like this. This small, a few millimeters long, very sort of easily overlooked um, insects. But rogue beetles are kind of incredible organisms if you're interested in how interactions between species evolve, um, largely due to this secondary modification of the body plan, this flexibility. So when rope beetles like this one here evolve from an ancestral beetle that look pretty much like tribolium or something like this, they lost this physical protection of the abdomen. It's kind of an Achilles heel. It enabled them to move rapidly through substrates, but they left themselves physically unprotected. So what rope beetles have done is transform themselves into really the chemists of the animal kingdom by evolving chemical defense glands at the tip of the abdomen, which in different lineages are able to produce really diverse classes of compounds. Okay, so if you look at a rogue beetle like this, and something like an aggressive ant will approach it, it will attack this beetle, but the beetle can chemically defend itself by looping its flexible abdomen around, blasting the ant in the face, with benzoquinones in this case, and saving its own life. And so as ants have risen to ecological dominance in terrestrial ecosystems over the past 50 million years, these beetles were essentially pre-adapted for coexistence with them and have radiated in very ant-dense environments. Okay, now what these beetles have also been able to do is via changes in their behavior, and changes in their chemistry, the exocrine gland chemistry in the abdomen, hundreds of lineages independently have evolved into what we call myrmecophiles. These are symbiotic species which are able to assimilate into the social fabric of ant colonies and live a socially parasitic, exploitative uh, existence. And many of these organisms are behaviorally remarkable that forge really intimate social behaviors and gain acceptance inside ant colonies. This is just a video of one of the species that we work with in my lab, Skeptobius. And you can see it's chemically subdued this ant and it's climbed on top of it and is grooming this ant to steal an ant's particular hydrocarbon pheromones, which it uses to plug its own body to achieve perfect chemical resemblance so it can gain acceptance inside the nest. Um, and if you look across the phylogeny of rogue beetles, you see this repeated evolution of this way of life, this myrmecophily. And so this is a tree that we published uh, a few years ago of one of the subfamilies where this way of life is very common. Um, you can see all of these black lineages here that form a backbone to the tree. These are free living lineages that have these typical uh, row beetle morphology that do not socially interact with ants and non symbiotic. But you can see repeatedly over a dozen times these remarkable ant mimic lineages have evolved, each one obligately associated with a single genus of ant. Okay, so we have this really kind of profound convergent system here whereby every time a rogue beetle has evolved to ecologically interact with ants, its morphology and aspects of its behavior have walked down this really predictable evolutionary trajectory to generate what's pretty unique in the metazoa, this convergent system of social and symbiotic evolution. So in my lab, we're interested in the brains of these beetles and how they are able to recognize ants and interpret them either as threatening organisms in the case of free living species or symbiotic partners in the case of the myrmecophiles. And we're also interested in the glands themselves and their ability to synthesize different kinds of natural products, some with behavior manipulating effects on other organisms. So the one uh, kind of subfamily of rogue beetles that we really focus on are called the Aliocorini. This is a clade of 17,000 species. Um, it's the largest subfamily in the animal kingdom. It's the largest subfamily of rogue beetles. And you can see from this phylogeny, which I'm going to kind of reveal to you, they come from a pretty unremarkable phylogenetic stock. So all of these uh, outgroup subfamilies here, they lack 
the chemical defense gland. This is the inside of the abdomen here, and they're, they're pretty species poor. They've not, never really evolved a symbiotic lifestyle. They're really kind of excluded from tropical ecosystems when ants dominate. Um, but then along this branch here, what we refer to as the higher alley of Rhinia, this is the largest clade, um, includes most species of Alleocorines. The gland evolves and the diversity of this group explodes. So now there's a pro, you know, 17,000 species and maybe 100, 200,000 species out there in total. So this is a remarkable event in the evolution of life that we think has kind of got its origins in the assembly of this key innovation, this turtle gland, that enables these beetles to create enemy-free space around themselves and coexist in ant-dominated habitats. What alleocorines have really done to solve this ecological problem is evolve an organ de novo. Okay, they've stitched together new cell types, which the outgroup species don't have, that work together to give this beetle the chemical defense mechanism. And so in my lab, we've used this organ to understand how cell types evolve to cooperate with each other to generate emergent organ level behaviors change the properties of the organisms that possess them. Now, this is a you know enduring biological problem. If you think, think about something like the mammalian eye, that's a very complex organ, there's 70 different cell types all working together to enable our visual system. And it's kind of a mystery where this cooperativity between cell types emerges, how it's uh, um, pieced together during evolution. If you think about um, going all the way back to Darwin, his famous quote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Biologists ever since then have been trying to understand how complexity at the organ level emerges, largely through, I would say, the developmental processes. But the functional evolution of organs, this cooperation between cell types, is something we know far less about. And there are really two challenges here. One of them is understanding how new cell types are assembled at a molecular level during evolution. That, to me, is a hard problem, but not quite as hard as the second problem, which is understanding how sets different cell types evolve to cooperate with each other to generate organ-level properties. Okay. So we look to things like glands, which are a real kind of paradigm of organ novelty across the metazoa. These are structures that have evolved thousands of times convergently, in each case uh, using novel cell types that often, again, function collectively to generate gland behavior as biosynthetic cell types, um, are capable of producing different natural products. So if you look across the animal tree of life, you know, new ecologies and the invasion of new ecological frontiers has really been enabled by changes in glandular chemistry, things like chemical communication, and the ability to modify the immediate surroundings through chemical secretions. And if you look into these glands, you find these wondrously diverse cell types, these secretory cell types, which are often taxon-specific, so lineage-specific. And they often work together to generate these emergent organ level, gland level properties. The classic example is the kind of favorite of uh, creationists is the bombardier beetle, where there are these distinct secretory cell types, each of which are contributing different compounds to the final explosive secretion. So how you make this kind of bioactive cocktail, how you evolve to make it, is a real enduring mystery. So this is the problem that we decided to look at in rove beetles. And so my lab has pioneered the genetically tractable model rove beetle, Dolotia coriaria. Um, it's our kind of version of Drosophila. Grows very fast, lays lots of eggs, has a small genome, so you can do genetics with it. Um, and if you uh, look into the abdomen of this species valley operand rove beetle, this is what you see. This is the, what we call the turbo gland, the chemical defense gland. Um, it's uh, an invagination of the dorsal abdomen between segments six and seven. So usually there's kind of intersegmental membrane that connects the segments of insects. In the case of this rove beetle, the intersegmental mem membrane between segments six and seven is in invagulated inside the body cavity to make this big reservoir. Okay, and then there are two cell types which are found nowhere else 
that secretes into this reservoir. There's this purple one that comprises this epithelium here, and then these green ones uh, with, uh, that have this kind of biosynthetic bowel and this duct. Okay, and together they synthesize this cocktail of compounds. There are three benzoquinones, which are nasty topical irritants, and then there are these other um, uh, uh, compounds, an alkane, short, uh, medium chain alkane, undecane, and then three medium chain esters. Okay, and they're produced by these two cell types, the bulbous secretory cells and then the reservoir cells. And just to kind of reiterate, these are not found elsewhere in the metazoa. Okay, if you look in the direct out group of alleoporine rose beetles, the subfamily tachyporidae, the structure doesn't exist and they cannot make these compounds. So how have these rose beetles evolved this structure and this ability to do this? So this is work led largely by Adrian Bruckner, who's a postdoc in my lab. Um, and he and I dissected small numbers of individual cells of both cell types, um, and performed plate sequencing, smart sequencing, um, uh, on these cells uh, to generate cell type specific transcriptomes, what we call the reservoir cells, or these gland units, okay, to try and identify biosynthetic enzymes involved in the synthesis of these compounds. Uh, and what we were able to do is, once we've identified kind of candidate enzymes, we can inject the third install larvae with double-stranded RNA targeting these enzymes. Um, the uh, beetle then pupates, and this is when the gland develops. And then when the adults hatch, whatever gene that we've knocked down is still silenced. And then we can profile the gland secretion to see if there are changes in the composition of the cocktail the beetle is producing. So um, to just guide you through what we found uh, in terms of um, defining the pathways that function in these glands, uh, the first cell type we refer to as the solvent cells because they are responsible for generating the alkene and ester compounds uh, via the following pathway. There are, there's an enzyme that we call master fats, a fatty acid synthase, uh, which is upstream most in the kind of in this, uh, biosynthetic cascade that generates these four compounds. If you silence this fatty acid synthase, you retain the benzoquinones, but you lose the alkane and the three esters. Okay, so these are gas uh, uh, chromatography traces here. Now, what master fats is doing is it's producing two um, uh, uh, fatty acid precursors, a uh, 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 C12, a carbon-12, fatty acid and a carbon-10 fatty acid, okay? And these are upstream of two branches, one leading to the esters, one leading to the alkanes. Downstream of the alkanes, uh, there's a fatty acyl-CoA reductase, or FAR enzyme, which is responsible for reducing the fatty acid to make an aldehyde, the decanal. Okay, if we knock this thing down, we lose the um, alkane, but we still retain the esters, okay? And then the, um, uh, that aldehyde has to be decarbonylated, okay, to produce the final alkane. And we found this um, specialized cytochrome P450, Cytochrome G, that's responsible for that. So again, when we knock this thing down, we lose the alkane, but re retain the esters. And in this case, we have a buildup of dodecanal, which is the precursor for the alkane. Okay, so this is this branch of the pathway where um, this fatty acid synthase uh, produces a C12 fatty acid that's reduced and then decarbonylated to make the undecade. Um, on the other side of the pathway, there's a single alpha esterase enzyme, which when you silence, doesn't affect the alkane, but uh, causes loss of the esters specifically. Okay, and so we think that this esterase esterifies C10 um, fatty acid to produce ethyl decanoate and isopropyl decanoate, and small trace levels um, of uh, ethyl do uh, isopropyl dodecanoate as well. Okay, and then interestingly, when, when you silence this part of the pathway, the alkane branch, by knocking down the, the, the FAR or the site 4G, you can see this buildup of that C12 um, ester. And that's presumably because this precursor is now getting channeled down into this pathway. Okay, but usually this pathway sucks up all of that C12 um, fatty acid, so it's very specialized for that precursor. So that's the pathway, that's what the beetle's doing in this cell type to make these compounds. 
how did this pathway get kind of pieced together during evolution? So to address this question, we did um, 10x genomic single cell RNA seq on entire um, abdominal segments from Dolotia. So we did uh, segment seven that contains the gland, and segment six, which is a control. Um, Trypsin digested these segments, um, then did single cell RNA seq to generate this atlas of different cell types. Um, and to cut a long story short, say, uh, cell type 6 is, um, these are the solvent cells, they express all of those enzymes I just showed you. Okay, so how are the solvent cells kind of the product of an evolutionary process? Well, in what I'm going to tell you next, there are some other cell types that you need to have in mind, which are much more ancient and present in all other insects, and have acted as kind of cellular and transcriptal source material, uh, from which the uh, solvent cells have been um, assembled. Um, the first one of these cell types is a segmentally repeated cell type it's present in every segment of the beetle's abdomen and uh, present in all insects too. The first one is the um, cuticular cells themselves. Okay. Then there is a cell type down here called the ventral fat body. These are adipocyte, like you know, lipid biosynthesis and fat storage cells, again present in all insects. And then these blue cells, these are in, called enocytes. Okay, these are pheromone producing cells present in all insects that manufacture long chain, very long chain particular hydrocarbons that coat the insect body and function as pheromones. They secrete these compounds, these alkanes and alkenes, onto the body surface. So, um, within this cell atlas, again, say, uh, these are the solvent cells here. What can we learn about the evolution of this solvent cell pathway by, look, by looking at these other cell types? Well, let's take, for example, the top enzyme here, master fat, fatty acid synthase. If we look at the expression of this enzyme, we find it's not just in the normal solvent cells, it's also in a couple of other cell types. You can see these beam speckles of cells here and here. Turns out these are fat body cells. So if we label this transcript, the master fats transcript with HCI, you can see it's strongly upregulated in the reservoir, but this was this other A single copy enzyme found in all insects. If you go as far back as Tribolium, which is a very distantly related beetle, it's also expressed in the fat body. Okay, so this is a very ancient enzyme that's been pulled into the turgle gland via co option. The same appears to be true for um, the, the alpha esterase, which is responsible for generating the esters. You can see not only is it on in the um, solvent cells, it's also on in the ventral fat body cells too, okay? So you can see these are these segmentally repeated bands of fat body in the ventral drosophila, uh, drosophila delotia abdomen. So we think this branch of the pathway evolved by co-opting, basically pulling these enzymes into the turbo plant to produce this ester branch of the pathway, okay? So this is how the beetle got its esters. What about the um, alkane branch? Well, if you look at the terminal enzyme, this cytochrome P4G, it's expressed exclusively in the solvent cells, right, and nowhere else, which is not particularly informative, except within the genome, there's another copy of this enzyme that actually sits in tandem, okay, so it's the product of gene duplication, and the sister copy of this enzyme is expressed in this cell type up here, this tiny cluster of cells up here, and if you label this transcript, you see these large cells scattered throughout the ventral abdomen, and these are the beetle's enocytes, okay, those pheromone-producing cells. If you silence this sister copy of this enzyme, you lose all the beetle's cuticular hydrocarbons. So these are carbon-27 to carbon-30 alkanes and alkenes um, in a, a, a wild-type gas chromatograph trace. And when you silence this cytochrome, you lose all of those compounds, okay? So that tells you that this cytochrome is a terminal enzyme in um, uh, alkane and alkene synthesis, and these cells that it's expressed in are the beetle's enocytes, okay? And so what this um, 
uh, enzyme is doing is basically identical functionally to what its uh, novel duplicate is doing in the um, uh, turbo gland, the solvent cells. Okay, so via gene duplication, you stitch a kind of terminal alkane decarbonylating enzyme downstream um, of the alkane branch of the pathway. Okay, and this is a recent duplicate found only in Alleoporini. So all species that have a turbo gland and make alkanes have this duplicate, and all um, other insects just have a single copy in the enocytes. Okay. Um, so what are enocytes doing? Well, they're doing something very similar to the solvent cells. They're taking um, manufacturing fatty acids, slightly longer ones, carbon-14 to carbon-18 usually, um, and then eventually they turn into alkanes, much like undecane over here, but uh, much longer chain lengths, okay? Uh, and what enocytes have that solvent cells appear not to have is this intermediate step, chain elongation, that's catalyzed by these elongase enzymes. So if you look at this cluster of cells up here, there are five elongase enzymes that take these fatty acids, um, massively elongate them, extend their chain lengths into the you know, 20s to 30s, uh, and then there are multiple fatty acyl-CoA reductases, these far enzymes that um, uh, um, convert them to aldehydes, and then the single cytochrome P4G that decarbonylates them. So you can see here, what's happened in these solvent cells is there's been this kind of convergent assembly of an enocyte-like pathway that's instead of producing very long chain compounds, producing these very, uh, these this medium chain alkane, which is much more volatile, okay? Instead of being this kind of waxy secretion on the cuticle, it's very, very liquid and highly volatile. So it lacks this elongate step. So that's how this pathway would, uh, evolved uh, in the turbo gland. How about the entire transcriptome of these novel solvent cells? Well, to understand this, we took our 10x data and did what's referred to as consensus non-negative matrix factorization, which tries to find constellations of co-expressed transcripts across all cell types in your data set. Okay, so you perform this kind of um, uh, factorization procedure to find these blocks of gene expression, which we can refer to as GEPs or gene expression programs, um, and in the entire kind of um, 10x data set from these abdominal segments, we find about 20 gene expression programs pretty accurately capture um, the kind of um, uh, transcriptomic modules which are expressed and shared between different cell types uh, within uh, uh, the, the, this tissue. So then we can ask, what is the contribution of each of these GEPs, these gene expression programs, to each of the cell types themselves? How are these cell types assembled from these larger blocks of gene expression? Um, and so this is a usage map that tells you what fraction of the transcriptome is composed of each of these large blocks of gene expression. This is a portion of that um, uh, usage map. And you can see here are the solvent cells. And they are composed of two of these gene expression programs, 9 and 17. So what are those? Well, 17, if you look, is the main gene expression program of the cuticle cells, which is not surprising because these are cells which are an invagination of the cuticle, right? They used to be kind of ancestral intersegmental membrane, um, and they maintain that, they retain that cuticular identity. Okay, so what is uh, gene expression program 9? Well, this is the defining expression program of the ventral fat body and the enocytes. Okay, so the solvent cells appear to be a transcriptomic hybrid of these two genic, much more ancestral cell types, the cuticular cells and um, the ventral fat body and enocytes, these fatty acids, lipid metabolizing, pheromone producing cell types. And so if you just kind of plot the usage of these two expression programs, you can see cuticular cells are almost entirely um, uh, 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 expressing this uh, program 17, the ventral fat body and enocytes almost entirely uh, program 9, whereas the solvent cells are somewhere in this kind of hybrid space here where they've taken the using expression of this uh, uh, um, gene expression program, uh, even though they are um, this, um, uh, derived ancestrally from uh, these cuticular cell types. 
So you can think of these solvent cells really as this transcriptomic hybrid, this evolutionary hybrid of two much more ancient cell types, the cuticle cells and the um, enocytes and uh, fat body, ventral fat body. And so we think what's happened during evolution is that this kind of region of the cuticle between segments uh, six and seven has gained this expression program which evolved in the fat body and enocytes it was pulled into these cuticular cells and transformed them into this secretory um, uh, biosynthetic uh, epithelium that uh, uh, transformed into the, the, um, the reservoir, the solvent cell reservoir. Okay, so those are the solvent cells. What about the benzoquinone cells? Well, it turns out that benzoquinones are made by another cell type that we call the BQ cells, which if you remember at the beginning of the talk, are um, these other cells uh, directly posterior to the reservoir, okay, the cells of the bulb and the duct. And I'm just going to whiz through quickly how we think the benzoquinone cells evolved to make these toxic compounds of benzoquinones. Well, when you feed the beetles tyrosine, you find the aromatic ring directly incorporated into the benzoquinones. So they're using tyrosine, or aromatic amino acids, as precursors to make these noxious compounds. And we think they do it by converting tyrosine to 4 hydroxy benzoic acid, um, which moves into the mitochondria and is converted into hydroquinone intermediates. Um, and we found a uh, set of enzymes which uh, are duplicated uh, copies of um, COQ enzymes that are involved in uh, eubiquinone synthesis, or coenzyme Q10 um, synthesis. Um, Coenzyme Q10 or ubiquinone is an electron, the redox active, like electron shuttle that all eukaryotes have um, that's involved in um, cellular respiration in the mitochondria. The beetles have duplicated these enzymes and they're now using them to convert um, tyrosine into hydroquinones. Okay, and this again is a unique duplication event that's happened in these allioporinal beetles specifically. This is this coenzyme Q3. Uh, one of these enzymes, and it's a single copy gene in almost all organisms. But in the alloporine road beetles, they duplicated it often twice, and one of these copies is expressed specifically in the benzoquinone cells, and it's making these hydroquinone precursors. The hydroquinones, you think, are secreted into this internal um, lumen um, inside the uh, um, cell. Okay, which you think is a kind of oxidation chamber where they are um, terminally oxidized by an enzyme that we refer to call decommissioned, because knocking it down like removes the um, you know ke 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 toxicity of the chemical secretion. What decommissioned is is a lapase. This is a, um, a copper a, a, a copper containing um, uh, uh, oxidase enzyme. Um, lapases are well known in insects for um, being involved in cuticular tanning, so this is a conversion of dietary tyrosine again into catechols that act as cross-linkers in the cuticle of insects, and if you knock them down you end up with these deep, deep pigmented, um, really weakly sclerotized, you know, soft-bodied insects. And what um, allioporines have done is duplicate one of these lapases, so they have a unique kind of power log, which is expressed specifically in the benzoquinone cells, um, that oxidizes these hydroquinones. So if you knock down this uh, enzyme decommission, you lose the benzoquinones, but you retain all of the solvent compounds in the secretion. Okay, so decommission oxidizes these hydroquinones, okay, and basically weaponizes them, because these are not particularly toxic compounds, but the benzoquinones absolutely are, and these then flood down the duct cells into the reservoir and combine with the fatty acid derivatives that alkane and esters produce by the solvent cells. And what we found is that the synergism between the products of these two cell types is essential for conferring the adaptive value of the gland. So, because we know the genes involved in the synthesis of these compounds, we can knock down and take out the function of either cell type um, and uh, uh, reduce the viability of these B cells in an ecologically meaningful context, which is in their chemical defense behavior with, uh, against ants. So, if you take these B cells, um, um, wild type 
beetles and put them in arenas with ants. They do pretty well because they can chemically defend themselves. But if you knock down the master fast gene or decommissions, you reduce that survival. So what is happening to these compounds when they combine? Well, it's actually quite simple. The benzoquinones are solid compounds. Okay, They cannot function as toxic agents on their own. They need the activity or the presence of these solvent compounds coming from the solvent cells to dissolve, to weaponize the secretion. Okay, now we did these uh, kind of droplet rheometric measurements to kind of study the physical chemical properties of the secretion. You can see even when you mix all of the um, benzoquinones together, they're still solids. But when you start to add the uh, alkane and the esters, you dissolve the um, uh, the benzoquinones, and you produce this kind of wonderful secretion that's able to kind of coat surfaces like arthropod cuticles, and it's very easy for the beetle to eject from the gland. It's got this perfect viscosity. It appears to be kind of close to optimal. Like if you substitute at the um, alkane for the esters, so it's, and the esters are the primary solvent instead of the alkane, you get this really, really weakly um, surface active secretion. Okay. And if you extend the chain lengths of the alkane, so you, you know you start to instead of carbon eleven, you have these slightly longer um, ch ch uh, 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 chain length solvents. Things start to solidify and the, um, and become less surface active. Okay, and so we think that when the beetle kind of um, evolved the uh, um, uh, ability to make these medium chain length instead of longer chain length. Um, fatty acid precursors, um, it enabled it to create this kind of um, secretion that has this like, op relatively optimal um, uh, um, phys physical chemical um, uh, comp composition. Um, and this is important because, as I sh told you earlier, the beetle recruited at these enzymes kind of convergently to make this alkane pathway that resembles the one found in the enocytes, and if it had directly co-opted that pathway, it would have made compounds, that these solvent compounds that were far too long to be able to dissolve and manipulate the benzoquinones. Okay, so it's kind of key that it was able to kind of um, uh, um, assemble a pathway capable of making medium chain compounds, which are to, to the shorter end of the chain length spectrum, to produce this secretion. You can then test the kind of toxicity of this um, uh, um, uh, cocktail to, again, demonstrate how these components are synergizing with each other. So if you add either just the, just the esters, the alkane, even just the alkane and the esters, or the benzoquinones, which are, remember, remember these are solids, um, and so we just use powder of, of, of the benzoquinones in this case, um, and immerse uh, Drosophila larvae in these in, in these compounds, um, you don't really reduce the survival of these um, of, of the larvae at all, um, or very kind of negligibly. But if you start to combine these compounds together, so now the benzoquinones are either dissolving in the esters or the alkane, or both the alkane and the esters, you dramatically reduce the survival because the secretion can now coat the cuticle of the Drosophila larvae and penetrate and, and kill the animal. Um, so that demonstrates the kind of adaptive value of combining these components that are, are produced by these different cell types. You can also observe Delotia, this road beetle, sometimes applying the secretion to its own body. And there's been a hypothesis out there that actually maybe what the beetles are doing when they execute this behavior is using a, a possible antimicrobial effect of the secretion. Um, and so we tested whether this uh, secretion had antimicrobial properties by adding it to um, Pseudomonas fluorescence culture medium. And you can see when you add any of the compounds um, in isolation, or even pairs of the compounds, you do not reduce the growth of this bacterium. But when you add all three, the benzoquinones, the alkanes, and the esters together, you um, drastically reduce the growth. Okay, and this, to my knowledge, is synergism between these relatively simple compounds and this kind of repressive effect on microbial growth has not been demonstrated before. But again, it shows how this is an adaptive synergism between the two cell types. So, taking all of this together, we've proposed what we refer to as this cooperative niche 
creation model of organ evolution. Um, and in the case of the tubal gland, we think what's happened is this ancestral kind of cute, dorsal cuticle of the, uh, uh, of the beetle um, first gained the expression of this uh, um, uh, gene expression program 9, which uh, transformed this, the um, uh, epithelium into this outing ester biosynthesizing gland. Okay, and this enables the subsequent evolution of these benzoquinone producing cells, which could exploit the um, prior evolution of these alkane and ester compounds as a solvent. Okay, and in this way, these, uh, the second cell type evolved that was functionally dependent on the prior evolution of this first cell type to unlock the potency of these compounds. And when that happens, the two cell types are now codependent on each other. The, the prior cell type, these solvent cells, are now adaptively dependent on the second cell type to realize the relative selective advantage of the two cell types working together. And through this process, you have the emergence of organ-level behavior, this interdependence between these two, two cell types, and then becoming locked in as this unit that's evolving under selection for organ-level properties. Now, if you look across the evolutionary tree of rogue beetles, this is a phylogenomic tree that we uh, subsequently produced. What you can see is that this early branch of the hyaluronidae that have the turtle gland, the hypocyptines, they lack benzoquinones. Okay, so this is consistent again with the solvent compounds, things like alkanes and esters evolving first, and benzoquinones subsequently. But after that. All of these lineages um, maintain this, this, uh, the, the benzoquinones, and um, they vary the composition of the um, uh, solvent secretion, these alkanes, aldehydes, esters, and things like that, probably to streamline the physical chemical properties of the secretion to match their ecologies. If you look at these, the earliest branch of the tree here that possesses benzoquinones and alkanes, um, this try alleoporine and do this single cell RNA seq, smart seq. You can see that despite them being over 100 million years divergent, they possess the same genetic toolkit. They're all, both of these cell types are kind of functionally very similar to each other and transcriptomically very similar to each other too. In fact, you can do a PCA to show that the two cell types, despite their um, uh, evolutionary divergence between the species and transcriptomically more similar to each other. Um, there has been pretty remarkable plasticity too in the um, secretions that these people have used. So, for example, in this lineage here, uh, 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 genus Lyonotoxus um, uh, 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 is added in these uh, um, aromatic um, esters here. And this has enabled this beetle to now invade ant colonies. So if you see the secretion these beetles produce, it's highly volatile. It's not a nasty chemical defense like benzoquinones, but it intoxicates ants and turns them into these kind of inebriated um, things that kind of meander around the colony. You can see this here. So the, beetle, the ants are uh, not attacking these beetles. And these beetles are leaking out these aromatic esters produced by the tidal gland um, so the beetle is, can you know, maintain a permanent presence inside the colony um, and evolve into a symbiont. Um, and you can see down here, you can see down here, this one uh, group has actually lost all of these compounds. This is a um, uh, one of these myrmosophiles, which is found inside army ant colonies in the neotropics, and it's secondarily lost the fertile gland. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we, we, we want to leave Oh yeah, this is my final slide. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I put up these examples here just to show that this kind of chemical key innovation in rogue beetles had dramatic macroevolutionary consequences. Um, it enabled these beetles to radiate globally um, in these ant-dominated environments. They were able to also tweak the chemistry of this innovation to adjust them to new um, niches. And they would also abandon the structure if they no longer needed it in the case of these socially integrated species, which um, now are found nowhere else except inside these ant colonies and are no longer reliant on a chemical defense mechanism and are basically treated like blood nestlings. Um, I'll stop there um, and 
Thank you all for listening. Uh, I'd like to thank members of my lab, in particular Adrian, who led the work on the, um, the evolution of the turbo gland, and Sheila, who's uh, carried out most of the kind of phylogenomic comparative studies of this structure and this chemistry across species. Um, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. We have time for one more like this. So for example, in Delotia, we are using CRISPR to take out the, um, that cytochrome P4G enzyme that makes the cuticular hydrocarbons to make a chemically blank slate beetle. Um, and that's what many of these myrmecophiles have done, is silence endogenous cuticular hydrocarbon production so that they can, through physical interactions, acquire those compounds from ants. Um, and so we're interested to see what happens when we do that with Delotia. Maybe now it's you know as this sort of stealth beetle, it's no longer attacked by the ants. It's kind of you know innately programmed to debate on ant food and things like this. And maybe some of these interesting behaviors that you see in these myrmecophiles are actually the products of like unlocking some behavioral plasticity because they are very very convergent with many of these social behaviors. So maybe they rely on some inherent plasticity of the beetle to opportunistically interact with that. Okay, last question. So, can, James Briscoe from the Francis Crick Institute, can you say anything about um, the relationship between sort of the, the chemistry and genetic um, innovation and the behavioral innovation? Can you um, connect between the genetic and uh, chemical innovation to the behavioral? Uh, yeah. So, uh, um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, in many ways, so you evolve this, you know, chemical defense gland, but you still have to hook it up to the nervous system, and so there's a unique motor system in the abdomen to operate this gland and deploy it. Um, this is all contingent on, you know, peripheral and central nervous system adaptations that, you know, enable the beetle to really reliably recognize ants and execute this behavior. Um, in terms of you know, and that generated this kind of ground plan in these beetles, these free, the free living beetles that made them very good at kind of chemically defending themselves against ants. Um, in terms of what happens subsequently, in terms of you know, evolution and behavior, the, the gland and you know, the brain are basically co evolving with each other, changes in one enabling changes in the other. We think probably changes in chemistry are, um, occur first. Right? Because you know, if you start you know, trying to socialize with an ant without some kind of chemistry to back it up, you're not, you're not going to get very far. So we think chemistry is probably the facilitator for sub subsequent changes in behavior. And, that, and that's why doing things like you know, trying to make um, this kind of chemically invisible beetle through silencing endogenous CAC biosynthesis is, is interesting because it might tell you how far just changes in chemistry can get you in enabling behavioral interactions to arise between these free living beetles um, and social insects. Thank you very much. Uh, we have to move on. So, Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker.